biomimicry workshop. Um, today we're just having presentations on the three teams who completed the solutions their, to their challenges. And we're going to have each uh, a member from each team present. So as you present, ask me to advance your slide. Just say next, and I'll advance the slide at that time. <coughs> Although I can't advance the slide right now. The slides are not advancing. <laughs> is there something up? Um, is there something else I, I need to do, Myla? Um, if you go into the lower corner, does it does an arrow come up? The lower um, other, mm, the other No, corner. I don't see an arrow anywhere. Oh, there it is. OK, now I have it. Great. OK. So. This, uh, for this workshop, we had four challenges. We had the climate change challenge, how does nature adapt to changing water availability? And the people who were on that team were unable to get together to form the final solution, so we don't have a result for that one. For team communicate, how does nature communicate between species and to the young? Team disturb and nets, how does nature manage extreme amounts of water, both physically and chemically? And team life bud, how does nature foster a connection and maintain symbiotic relationships? So thank you all for participating in this workshop. Initially, 25 students enrolled in the workshop, and 13 of you finished the course. So congratulations. Today, you will present the results of the work you did during the course and the in-person session with the assistance with from certified biomimicry professionals. We all look forward to hearing about your solutions. The teams will present in the order they are listed on the slides. I will um, advance your slide as you say next, and be sure to speak loudly and clearly as you present. Since we have only one hour for this recorded lecture, each team will have about 10 minutes to present, so keep your comments short. Team Communicate will have 20 minutes since they solve for two different applications. There will be a few minutes at the end of the webinar for questions or comments, so please hold your questions until then. It's been a pleasure to meet all of you and to transfer my knowledge and excitement over the use of biomimicry with you, and I hope you'll continue to explore nature, nature's wonders and serve to advance the biomimicry meme. Okay, let's hear from Team Communicate. Take it away. Thanks, Marie. So we are Team Communicate, Jane, myself, Kate Gregory, and Tim. And uh, you can go to the next slide. I'll give you a little bit of background on our team. So the initial team formed around our common interest in how nature cleans. And we identified two areas of focus. So virtual communication, which as another group broke off and focused on virtual communication with diverse groups. And our group, Jane, Tim, and I, focused on education for children and how nature communicates with its young. At the in-person session in August, we received expert feedback that helped us move toward our outcomes for our team. It was really helpful. Jane was there and um, got a lot of great feedback and really helped clarify and um, help us move forward. So our concepts were created and then presented at that workshop in Montana, the in-person workshop. And then after that workshop, we came back together, Jane, Tim, and I, and really worked to refine that um, the, our direction forward. Next slide, please. Um, Jane, are you on the phone? Because this is going to be your slide, I think. Maybe, maybe she's not able to. Um, okay. Yes, can you hear oh, me? Okay. Uh, OK, great. OK, so first I'll give a quick overview of the expert feedback that we received at the Montana workshop. And we arrived at the workshop <clears throat> with, um, with the team having gone through the scoping and brainstorming and, and um, talking about design solutions. And as Kate, men as, uh, Kate mentioned, we had identified two different areas of interest. Uh, but we came with um, just a, a little bit of uh, a need for some advice from the experts. Well, actually, a lot. Because <laughs> we had our, our, our challenge with how does nature communicate with its young 
but and we had search askNature.org for ideas and how to emulate nature and or examples of um, that we could leverage. Um, but basically, but with the feedback from the experts, um, they really helped us to to focus in on on the elements of biomimicry that we were really targeting. And I think that was sort of a moment when <clears throat> Jamie and Karen um, basically took a, took a step back and said, this is really uh, that reconnect and ethos elements of biomimicry that we're talking about. And these are important uh, projects or areas to, to think of or to, to explore. So the other piece of advice that they gave to us was to think about what the product was that we wanted to have, what was our outcome. And then uh, in discussing using eyesight tools, which is part of the reconnect exercises, as part of a way to achieve the goals of nurturing learning and stewardship in the young. And also, as Karen and Jamie both uh, encouraged us to look at how nature communicates through this to the census, so this is a possible focus area for educational or lesson plan. So we integrated, we also uh, in, in the workshop talked about integrating elements of traditional ecological knowledge into the project, which uh, we hope to incorporate in this lesson plan. So on the next line, the context, so just starting from the context again that we were talking about an in-person training, learning with children, learning in nature with young children. And the approach uh, following uh, during the Montana workshop helped us to really focus in on developing a lesson plan that integrates the reconnect and ethos elements of biomimicry. And in the lesson plan, as um, Karen and Jamie both encouraged us to outline the logistics, the target audience, the time frame materials, and in talking with, and our team agreed that we would really integrate um, nature's design principles and how nature communicates, learns, and teaches through repetition, modeling, playing, and since another, in, in addition to the census. And another key part of the lesson that we want to integrate is providing something that is a tangible take-home um, project or item that serves as a reminder to to uh, to the to the students who participate in the class to to carry their knowledge forward. Um, the next slide is for Kate. Okay, your team has five minutes left. So, as far as the lesson plan outline, we um, looked at various sources online and found the main components of a lesson plan, which you can see here. We really wanted to make sure it was relatively short and adaptable, knowing that um, folks in various educational settings would be using the tool, hopefully, from a traditional school setting to sort of a nature center setting. Um, we're targeting nine years to 11 years, so third through fifth grade. And we are going to create this lesson plan that will have these various very typical lesson plan elements that apparently are very helpful if you're in the education profession. Next slide, please. So as our objective, we, um, Dana was really helpful in helping us focus in on this is what you want to think about when you're reaching out to kids. What do you want them to think, feel, and do? And so we wanted them to think about the interconnectivity of the natural world and the elements and really feel awe and excitement. And we wanted them to get a spark and proactively want to learn more about nature, spread enthusiasm, and really foster stewardship in these kids. So we were thinking the take home could be anything from a drawing to a poem or a story or some type of object that they could display in their rooms, share with others, share with their families. Um, that would be a fun part of the project to come up with what they could take home with them. Next slide. One of the items that was really important to us was to make sure that we had some examples of how amazing nature is at communication. And so we used AskNature.org 
to find some examples of that. There wasn't much on the site about specifically how nature communicates to its young, its young, but we did find many examples of just straight up how nature communicates. We knew that sharing some examples that would give sort of the wow factor and get them really excited about nature and its communication skills uh, would be a really important part of the lesson plan. So some examples here are the Siamese fighting fish. You can see on the right, a lot of kids have beta fish. Um, and those fish use their fins to create vibrations in the water and also just visual signals to other fish about danger. Of course, many of us are familiar with elephants. They're on the left and the infrasound that they um, push out, and the noise they create to communicate with each other that's often much below the level of hearing um, of humans. We've cut our ants. I do believe they create a chemical trail. And I will admit I'm not super certain what the um, fourth picture there on the right is. Yeah, um, that, Tim, Tim sent that one in, and that one is actually a bird's eye view of some people excavating, working in an area that was created by the leafcutter ants. So oh, that's unfortunately, Tim oh, that's right. it. I remember that. Yeah. Um, OK, so next slide. Back to you, Jane. Oh, OK. Um, yes, OK, so, so this part of the key core part of the, the lesson plan, or a toolkit for, for to include eyesight exercises. And I think it's probably one of the most interesting and effective ways to engage children in, in learning about nature. But the, so the eyesight, the, so as an example, so eyesight exercise to immerse for, to immerse in nature, and uh, the, just the general concept is outlined here. And of course, it could take many different formats depending on the, the the context and the location and the time that you have. But you could start by having the children sit in a in an eyesight area and focus on the senses, and then ask them to locate places within the area where animals or plants communicate using any any of the senses or signals and presumably this is after after you've done some introduction about the senses and introducing the students to the area that you're in um, and the idea is to just provide the opportunity for the students to go out and identify or do their own exploring and identify um, plants or animals that use various senses and then have them come back and teach the kids, teach the teachers basically about their observations or and then use this creative um, thanking nature element to both demonstrate what they've learned and share and, and as, a, as a way of um, further strengthening the knowledge that they learned to and, and encouraging their, ultimately the long-term goal is to foster stewardship, but this eyesight is just an example of one of the tools that could be developed. OK, your time's up. Do you have more to oh. present? Yeah, next slide, please. Just a couple more slides. Um, and that, Kate, if you would like to close it out, we just have one or two, just two slides. Yeah. Thank you. Those are just some examples of the Seek Home project that kids could work on. We tried to incorporate the senses a lot into our ideas when we were talking about what the kids could do. Um, so such sachets, apparently there are a lot of, Googled it, there are a lot of ways to make scented dyed bookmarks using natural materials to incorporate the scented, senses or um, the scent hunts, et cetera. Next slide. So ultimately, we learned it took us a lot of time to gain clarity on our topic. It was great that Jane was able to go to the in-person session and really get that feedback from the experts, need us to mull it over and um, hear really how this topic could connect to the principles of biomimicry. So that was great. Um, we talked a lot about our desired impact. And we really just hope that were this lesson plan to be created, that it would be fun and it would be adaptable in various settings because um, we know it's hard to incorporate new things into um, the typical school day. So we're hoping it would be sort of a, a good thing to pique interest in biomimicry and nature as a whole for kids. Next slide. 
Okay. Well, thank you. That sounds great. Um, let's go on to the next presenter. Um, are you ready, uh, Kendra? Do you want to unmute yourself if you're muted? Yep. Yeah, I can okay. All right. So uh, I'm part of the second half of the communication group, and uh, it was mostly working with Martin to this point. So we'll go on to the, the next slide, which sort of envisions the, the process that we started with. And this is kind of a, a mind map that uh, displayed connections of what was involved in communication. So we're trying to sort of pick apart the different aspects and functions of communication. And that's what sort of led us on the next slide to us branching off into two different groups. So again, just to reiterate, we broke up into uh, a group, a, a team looking at how a how individuals engage in a, in a group together, in a diverse group, uh, which later became uh, a, on, in virtual communities and also educating children. So the virtual communities starts on the next slide in a format that we called learning landscapes. So looking at communication on an online learning platform and using biomimicry as a tool to design this learning learning platform effectively. So next slide. So taking taking the idea of how does nature communicate and distilling it down to how does nature engage participants. So often in online formats, you need people to come to keep coming and to be engaged in that process. On the next slide. We look at the, the a deeper context of that, which is in an online coursework context, where historically so far there's been data from some studies that show in online classes there's less persistence, so that means kids staying enrolled, and the uh, grades are typically lower for people who take online classes as compared to classes in person. So that then brings us to our next slide, uh, which the hypothesis is that if we view these online course communities as ecosystems, then we can use biomimicry as a tool to design systems that uh, keep people engaged and the thesis or the, the hypothesis there is that by increasing engagement, we foster uh, better enrollment and participation. So the next sort of steps of this process were to identify some design principles from nature that can that will help facilitate a uh, a process that develops these engaged ecosystems. So we'll start with our first next slide. Uh, design principle. Which is developing a space that is resource rich and protective that allows for a diverse community to thrive. And this falls out from the natural function of how does nature maintain community in an ecosystem. And for this example, uh, we used the the function of a bromeliad. So bromeliads create safe and nutrient-rich environments for a diversity of organisms to live and thrive and interact. So in the bromeliad, inside of the, um, the, the inside of the flower, water is allowed to collect where algae, microorganisms, and and other flora and fauna can can mingle and interact in order to create a, a micro ecosystem inside of that space and it's safe and protected from the outside world. So creating an analogy to this uh, virtual system is, ha is creating a, a portal or a, an environment where, where even in a virtual space, students, teachers, and administrators can come together to participate in this course. So 
the portal is an interface, like a website, where uh, there's a access to sharing of information, of resources, and is particularly designed to be a place where, where people want to go and to share uh, their information and their resources. So whether that you know it it almost looks like a uh, like a Sim City sort of landscape. It's a, a visually appealing and brings people in where they want to be connected. Which uh, then also goes to our next slide of how to create those spaces. I incorporated some traditional knowledge or uh, customs, uh, and these also a lot of these these techniques or tools can don't necessarily have to be for a specific online course or online community, but in general, tools to utilize in any sort of gathering uh, where meetings are taking place. So some of these traditional knowledge elements also play into that of how do you create these safe spaces, safe spaces or a container for interaction to happen. And a big part of that is having rituals or opening ceremonies where an agreement is, is, is conducted or um, people have this sort of psychological schedule that now you're entering into the space where you're going to be engaging with each other and uh, we are going to leave our you know, other life behind and commit to, to being authentic and open in this new learning space. And another tool is a talking stick. So, in you know, in a in a in person context, this would be an actual physical object that you pass around. But in a virtual context, it could be even a, a button that you press to you know get in the queue to say I want to hold the talking stick, and then you know it automatically mutes everyone else, and one person is allowed to speak at that time. So in our next slide, we go into another design principle, which is entities form symbiotic relationships in which each depends on the other's resources. And the function that this comes from is how does nature maintain a relationship of interaction? So how do two different species come together and stay together? And the, the, the life strategy that this comes from is, is one example of many is the sea anemone and the clownfish. So they form a symbiotic relationship in, in which they need to exchange resources. Uh, the clownfish uses the stinging protection of the sea anemone. And in return, the territorial nature of the clownfish protects the sea anemone from other predators. So we can use that strategy, again, in, in an online format by how do we first identify what the needs and resources are in a community. So that could be put into a database of saying, OK, maybe and it doesn't have to be school related. It could be uh, you know, maybe somebody needs babysitting or somebody needs tutoring. Uh, and then on the other hand, somebody is available for tutoring or babysitting or has a, a space to study at. And so really visualizing what those needs and resources are. And potentially, the database system could match people up to say, oh, this person has something that you need. Or maybe it's just something that is a forum that people can browse. And this also I found really useful in any sort of community group to have a database that just says who the people are and what they do and what their skills are. And, and to have that available for a new group that's forming, whether it's online or in person. So that just creates an ability to form relationships and connections with other people in the group and sustain uh, these relationships over time. So then we can go to our next slide. Our next design principle, number three, one of my favorites. And again, I'll give props to Ted for this one. Uh, he inspired this when we were at our in-person session. So a community can self-regulate to determine the appropriate conditions for the group. And this falls out from how does nature self-regulate? So in the, example, the life example that we have here to exemplify this is a beehive. And 
happens in a beehive is that they're able to vary the temperature based on a different a spectrum of sensitivity. So when the, the bees get too hot, there's a certain number that have a threshold, let's say uh, five degrees over the normal temperature, then a small amount of bees will start fanning, start cooling off. But when it starts going up to 10 degrees, then you know, first we have a handful, now we have a, a larger group of bees that start fanning out. So it's actually a, a nonlinear or an exponential response that happens in the system. And what that allows for is a, a, uh, a control system that balances out the positive and negative to bring it back to an equilibrium. And the way that we can transfer that over into a community or communication setting is giving live feedback, to, to have a feedback loop where students are able to say, uh, is this is going too fast or this is moving too slow? or what's the, to get feedback on the general mood of the population of the group on that day to, to identify where the one's at emotionally, uh, intellectually, and, and helps the professor to, to, to moderate the, the content of the course or for even a student in administration to monitor the uh, the stress level or dissatisfaction of a community of students in order to, you know, bring in different events or to, to, to offer resources that are going to meet the needs of that group better. So in summary, going on to our next slide, We basically, lost. go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, so in summary, looking at these three design principles, the goal again uh, was to increase participation, retention, and sense of community in in online groups. So we talked about developing space that is research rich and protective that allows for diverse community to thrive, and and that included uh, bringing in some tools like uh, rituals and, and visually appealing atmospheres and uh, supplying the resources necessary to meet the needs of the students. In addition, we had uh, entities form symbiotic relationships in which each depends on the other's resources. And that example, we had uh, how can we create a, a visibility in what those needs and resources are for different participants and match those needs and resources to create long-lasting relationships. And, our, and last of all, we uh, had a, a community to self-regulate to determine the appropriate conditions for the group. So how can you incorporate uh, a feedback loop into the system in order to constantly monitor and regulate the, the, the moods, the needs, the, uh, the, the environment, the atmosphere of the community that you're participating in? So, this is sort of the strategy uh, we put together for working in these online groups. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Nature. And that's the end of this portion. Thanks, Kendra. Now we'll hear from the Dister Bandit. Ted? Ted, if you're on mute, would you unmute yourself? Hi, Marie. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hi, this is Matt. Um, I will fill in for Ted. Um, okay, great. He comes around. Just take, just say next, and I'll <laughs> advance the slides. Great. Um, so yeah, we're Team Dister Bandits, and we looked at flooding in Boulder, Colorado. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, here is our team. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so some of the methods that we used for this project, um, definitely Google Hangouts was crucial to, um, as Kendra was talking about, 
kind of create the community and have the learning landscape that you know fostered accountability for this kind of work. Um, so that was crucial. Um, and then I guess we started with biologizing the question and figuring out, you know, getting our heads into the realm of biomimicry. Um, we did our independent eyesight this, you know, these few months. Um, independent research, um, then we, you know, met up on Google Hangouts and we distilled some of nature's themes um, with some group brainstorming and then me and Ted uh, made it to the in-person session in Montana, which I think was super crucial and I learned a ton and just having the time and the space to you know really hash out some of the design details was really important um, so you can go to the next slide great so for scoping so uh, we we took the theme of disturbance and we narrowed it down to flooding specifically because Boulder had been experiencing some flooding recently that was pretty bad um, and so we were thinking like you know how does nature manage flooding and um, um, develop some biomimetic flood barriers to see if um, you know if that's possible and how that could help the situation that we experienced in Boulder um, a couple months ago. Um, so again, it's for Boulder, Colorado, and what we really want to emphasize is that in in my in my you know in my brain, biomimicry is for. Um, hold on, one second. There's some people in the room. Hey, I'm in a meeting right now. Is that okay? Cool. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, so we want to emphasize that um, so the principles of permaculture are using biology directly to solve some of the problems that you're facing like flooding. Um, we thought that that is the first step that should be taken in any sort of solution uh, that has to deal with I guess a landscape um, which flooding certainly does and so we emphasize that permaculture principles or direct use of biology to manage flooding would be first implemented before any work or research would be done uh, to do a technical solution using biomimicry because if the flooding problem can be reduced you know in the landscape itself then you would make the biomimic solution obsolete and doing you know using nature to solve your problem first I think is a great idea because you can create a better ecosystem which is really what we're trying to do so that was our kind of the basis of our work so we're assuming that permaculture is you know, implemented first and that the landscape is going to now reduce flooding to begin with. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so for discovering, we looked to, so we were thinking about uh, basically, you know, we wanted to not limit ourselves just to places that flood, but to just anything that deals with water because really that's what we're working with is water. It's how to manage um, so a great place to study a flood region is the Amazon rainforest because it has seasonal flooding. Uh, that is two extremes. Um, and so we found a lot of uh, different models that m manage water in that ecosystem. Uh, we also looked to our local biology, like in our backyards from our eye sites or Boulder Creek. Um, and then we also went to asknature.org. You can go to the next slide. So for, I guess, we did a lot of independent research and then we came back to Google Hangouts and we kind of some of the themes and categorized them uh, of some of nature's solutions. And so the three major themes that we discovered um, were that nature either completely avoids water, so it doesn't live in a water-prone or flood-prone region. Uh, it prepares for the incoming floods um, and just kind of waits it out until uh, it can the I guess the the preferred ecosystem um, and then the other option is to use it as a resource and so for that and you know if you can turn a problem into a solution that's really where you get a bunch of awesome things happening so we were shooting for that it's also probably the most risking and so we, we want um, um, to our, like a very dry climate, so like cactus, um, or you know, ecosystems or species that deal with very little water and then have solutions for managing it in that way, because we want to 
you know, use the water you know, as beneficial as opposed to kind of with it. You can go to the next slide. So, yeah, as I said, we wanted to focus on water as a resource uh, because that might lead to the best solution. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, now in that even smaller theme, uh, we looked at a bunch of stuff. Um, one thing at the uh, Montana retreat, we, you know, me and Ted were down by the creek and we noticed this moss that was growing. And it was really cool to see because we had, there's a big, you know, piece of timber that had been laying across the creek uh, so you can walk across it and we could see a succession of how the moss affected, affected the environment and we could see that you know the moss the primary um, succession of the moss was you know just moss and it was clinging onto the clinging onto the wood and then you could see other successions in in later succession where the moss had enough you know mass and nutrients stored in its, you know, high service area that when seeds fell in that region, they could germinate and then you got grasses growing in the moss. So that was really cool to see how the surface area of the moss, you know, held the water and, you know, used it as a resource. So when the, when the river was high or low, or if, if the river was high, the moss would absorb a lot of water and it can retain more water than if there was just the bare log and, you know, therefore nothing would grow. So that was a really cool thing to see. Um, and then we have the barrel cactus, which is studied a lot in, in uh, biomimicry. Um, I guess it's just a great example. So you have expandable water storage, rigid membranes within the uh, within the structure can allow for volume change and still be strong. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then we also looked at something called the barking spider, and it kind of used its web for water management uh, so it could build it up and kind of protect its hole from flooding uh, in when the floods come and it can also um, extract some water out of the air in the surface area of the surface area of the web and then it can drink from it so that's kind of pretty cool uh, uh, and then also just studying the cell, like any cell, you know, deals with water all the time. And so how does the cell kind of manage water? And, you know, what happens is the, you know, the water will enter the cell through like uh, little aquaporins or certain uh, structures in the, in the cell wall, enter the cell, and then move it to the vacuole. And then the vacuole will fill up with water pressure and then put that pressure back up on the cell wall. And so that is the mechanics behind a wilting leaf and if you you know if you are the plant the the structure can then get static um, and strong and that's due to osmosis and water um, hydrostatic pressure and so that's another really cool um, method I guess for dealing with water and you can go to the next slide So then we have a designing phase and trying to think about, okay, now if we're going to take this, these inspirations and go to a technical solution, um, what are some of like, you know, the customer needs? What, who would be using this stuff? You know, these barriers and, you know, who is, what's the market and that kind of stuff. And so we would say that, you know, this could, we want this to be a potential solution for just a homeowner or the whole city. Um, but again, if we can design it for some, for like a homeowner, for example, then the scalability hopefully will apply to the city. And so we're going to constrain ourselves and say, okay, we want something that's semi-permanent, easily deployable, semi that can uh, water that is kind of destroying the city as the structure itself, um, using potentially surface area um, and have them dynamically rise and fall with the floods uh, based off of the availability of water to then create the structure. Um, and then we would like to so use the water as a resource, right? So hopefully we could maybe find out a way so that, you know, in a lot of flood prone areas, like for tsunamis or something, when the floods do come in or, you know, um, a lot of uh, amenities are destroyed and so it becomes very um, inhospitable. And so if we could collect that water, purify it hopefully, and then have it be stored so that when the flood waters recede, we have stored water in these barriers so that people can then have pure water. Um, and so that would be great. And then we would like to use life-friendly chemistry to get this done. 
and you can go to the next slide. Okay, Matt, you have three minutes. Can you Great. Thank you. Okay, so here's our test. We did a sham wow with uh, in the kitchen sink, and you can see in the middle slide that you can see a, a bunch of water held up on the left, and then no water on the on the right, or very little. And you can see the structure filling up with water. So it's high surface area, incurs water uptake, creates a barrier, and the gravity holds the barrier in place. And then you go to the next slide. So this is a vision of how these things would work. Um, depending on their scale, they could be trucked in or, you know, hand moved out, unrolled, and they would uh, follow the height of the water, and then after the water leaves, they have some water uh, stored, and you can go to the next slide. And you can see from the bird's eye view, if we have the structure like the cactus, um, we can have more surface area for the water to be absorbed into, and we can have more structure, and then we can have multiple layers of these barriers to make sure no water kind of moves through. And you can go to the next slide. And so the next steps for this kind of research is, uh, you know, being able to use life-friendly chemistry is definitely a great thing. Um, and also studying the whole entire life cycle of how these things would actually be used. Um, also studying aquaporins. And so aquaporins are mechanisms in cell membranes that allow water to move through them, uh, pure water. And so if they can be, these structures are built in labs uh, for, um, can be, you know, experiments, and they're expensive, but that is a way of getting, basically, p distilling out pure water into a vessel, and so that would be very cool. Um, life cycle analysis, maybe these things would basically biodegrade, maybe they wouldn't, so thinking about how exactly they'd be manufactured, used, and then after use, how would they work. Um, and then structural testing, like how much water could they hold, what's the scalability, and what are some other applications. And you can go to the next step. So, okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, that's great. Okay, um, Peter, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, take it away. All right. Um, so, yeah, my name is Peter, and um, our team uh, consisted of myself and Wendy Weaver. Uh, go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Our function migrated uh, over the course of uh, the workshop over the months. We originally started out trying to focus on um, a question of how does nature maintain a symbiotic relationship between grazing and river systems. The group that we were working with is uh, a tribe, a confederation of tribes up in northwest Montana. And they had problems with a, uh, a large portion of their land has been degraded over time due to heavy use from um, ATVs and irrigation runoff and uh, cattle grazing. And so, again, we, we were starting off trying to figure out how does nature, nature maintain a symbiotic relationship specifically between the grazing and the river system. We were trying to carve off that one piece. And so we did a bunch of research into that area, uh, particularly looking at how the introduction of wolves back in the Yellowstone National Park has impacted the uh, growth of vegetation there. And we also looked at holistic grazing. And we found that there was a lot of um, still debate um, on, in, the, in that area as to what exactly was going on. And so it was really hard to find anything concrete that we could uh, pin our hat on to, um, to really extract out design principles and feel like we had something solid. So we, we stepped back and at the, uh, the workshop, we broadened our focus to just looking at how does nature maintain a healthy riparian system with a, a little bit broader approach there. Okay, next. And again, the, the group we're focusing on is the Confederated Salish and Kootenay tribes uh, up in northwest Montana. And in particular, they have a, a, a climate change oversight committee that we were working with to um, this project. And I'll say a little bit more about this later, but the delivery approach that we came up with was specifically, is specifically geared towards the, the women in the tribe and the children of the tribe, um, because they, um, the tribe's women historically, traditionally, have um, been the bearers of certain parts of their cultural heritage. So we saw that as a valuable piece that might be able to be used by the tribes going forward. And this information could also, of course, be used by other groups uh, out west. Next. 
the first piece that we we developed was a matrix. So after we arrived at our function of uh, really looking at what makes a healthy riparian system, we we took the Jocko River Master Plan, which is a document that was created several years ago uh, for the tribes uh, as, an, as part of an effort to help restore the river system. And this document basically outlined a lot of measures to restore the riparian system. And so we looked through that uh, to see what measures were being recommended. And then we also looked at, we, we, at the workshop, we took a walk out in nature and along a stream and just went to see what functions we could see, what uh, functions we could see being performed by nature that were really obvious, that stood out. And so from that, we, uh, we developed a matrix. And so the matrix basically gives a list of five functions that we were able to readily identify in nature, and then uh, contrasted those with uh, life, the life principles from biomimicry, and dropped into that matrix the different measures that the Jocko River Master Plan had developed to see how well they actually fit. So go to the next slide, please. So here's an example of the matrix. It's, it's much too large to fit in the slide here, so this is just one small piece of it. And so on the left side, you can see we've got functions listed, and then the next column gives you an example design, design principle. So the first function we have listed there is to slow the water flow down and dissipate energy. Um, the one design principle that applies to that function uh, that we saw out in, the, in that stream visit was uh, multiple structures of different diameter and shape that add travel distance to the water flow and absorb energy. This was basically twigs and branches and uh, leaves from overhanging plants and grasses and whatnot that all interrupted the water flow and slowed that water flow and absorbed the energy. This, uh, <clears throat> um, so then we, we took the measures from the Jocko River Master Plan, which are the items in that last column, uh, those items in green that are numbered, and I just picked one of life, life principles to, to focus on here again because of space limitations, to be locally attuned and responsive. And these measures that were from the Jocko River Master Plan fit both that life principle as well as this function. And so by doing this, by populating the matrix this way, we were able to see which measures fit a lot of the life principles and a lot of the functions. One thing that stood out in that second row there, I've got uh, some items that are colored in brown. Those are particularly uh, referencing some of the grazing management measures they had. And one interesting uh, result of, of this exercise with the matrix is that we saw that the grazing measures actually impacted fewer functions than some of the other measures, like stabilizing the bank and building uh, floodplain stabilization structures. <clears throat> so not that grazing management is unimportant, but it seemed like it didn't satisfy as many functions, and so maybe wouldn't be as high on the list in terms of prioritizing what should be done first. Okay, next. <clears throat> so from that, from that process, we identified several measures from the Jocko River Master Plan that really aligned with the biomimicry process. And those are the ones listed here. Build structures to stabilize both the banks and the floodplains. Uh, Revegetate both in the stream and on the banks, and then as well as on the floodplain. And then finally, modify land use causing instability. And that last item includes items such as the grazing management, <clears throat> as well as like doing uh, modifying the use of ATVs on the land, altering vehicles. Okay, next. So to, to convey this message to the tribes, what we came up with, uh, and, this, and this was inspired from the on-site session where we were looking at traditional ecolo ecological knowledge. And that triggered some ideas around, well, maybe the, the, tribe could get, the tribes could get together and as a community and develop a symbol for the riparian restoration that would draw from their cultural history and they could tie that to a list of restorative actions to make it more present in their daily lives. And as one example of this, they actually did this uh, a while back when they developed a flag for the, the, the Flathead Nations. And uh, that's what we've got shown here. And so they basically had a community event where they drew inspiration from the members of the community to come up with this, this imagery. 
So uh, there's a precedent for this. So hopefully they would be able to do something like this to develop something that could be used to drive restor restoration action. Next. And then the, the second piece of this, which, is, which would be really integral, is to invite the community to integrate this symbol and the message that goes along with it into they have an annual river honor honoring ceremony, which could be used to kind of launch this, this piece of, of the restoration effort, and also integrated into the artifacts of their daily lives. And again, this was inspired by looking at traditional eco ecological knowledge around the tribes. And historically, uh, traditionally, the, the tribes, uh, women have played a key role in passing on a lot of their cultural heritage to some of the artifacts of their daily lives. And that included things like woven articles and basketry and beadwork and clothing, things that they saw every day. And integrated into those, those items were symbols that they understood that represented things that were important to them. And so uh, perhaps the tribes today could do the same thing, integrate this river restoration symbol into items of their daily lives. And that can include modern things too, like t-shirts and bumper stickers or whatever. Uh, basically things that they're going to see on a daily basis that will remind them, hey, the river's important. We need to really do our best to, to keep it in good shape. Next. And they, they also have some existing efforts to educate children around how river systems work. So this could dovetail really well with that as part of that education program, bringing that, that kind of that, that branding idea into those efforts to say, here's a symbol of the river and here's what it means to help pass on that tradition. And another idea as well was to establish some kind of recognition system for tribal members who accomplish a set of restoration criteria. And this could mimic uh, historical past the status in the tribe. So that could be tailored specifically to uh, whatever the, the local group would, would want or desire. Okay, next. To give you some examples of the design principles that we saw when we went on our, on our walk out in nature, we saw um, grass, like I said before, these grasses and uh, branches and whatnot that were in the water that slow the water flow down and absorb energy. Uh, we also saw mesh of interwoven fibers that hold particles together, basically the root systems that of the plant that would prevent erosion and hold the land together. <clears throat> and then an, likewise, another mesh of interwoven fibers that trap particles and build new land. And that could be roots, but it could also be dead matter that falls, like a broken branch that falls into the river. And over time, and, and you know, grasses and vegetation that die and fall into the water, and over time, these form uh, meshes as well, and those serve to trap new particles and, and build land. Okay, next. And finally, uh, thanks to Nature for inspiration, and thanks to uh, everyone for being able to participate, participate in this workshop. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone who presented. I wanted to uh, leave you with some biomimicry resources here. Um, of course, this final presentation is being recorded, and it will be on the Peaks to Prairie webpage, along with the final report and some other documents. Uh, for general biomimicry information, you can contact the Biomimicry 3.8 or the Biomimicry Institute. Um, Ask Nature, you've all used that before. Um, I'm retiring as of the end of this month, so I'll no longer be with EPA, but here is my professional uh, biomimicry web uh, email address. If you'd like to get a hold of me, we can stay in touch. And if you'd like information on EPA's tribal program in biomimicry, you can contact Diana. So I'll open yeah. it now for any questions anybody has. We have about three more minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, people are thinking of their questions. Uh, this is Diana. I um, I also will um, put in a plug for additional biomimicry education. And if folks are interested, there's a Center for Biomimicry um, at Arizona State University. And if you're interested in pursuing a master's in science in biomimicry, um, I'll be graduating in December, which is exciting. Um, but check out Air, um, Arizona State University and Biomimicry 3.8. Um, for additional um, learning opportunities. And I just would mention, um, yeah, I worked on a pretty major 
River Restoration Project in Western Montana. So if um, beyond the tribal program, I could, um, I'd be happy to talk with anybody about that too. So thanks. Maybe, I, maybe you've had a minute to think of some questions now. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Well, thanks again for everybody participating in the workshop. I've sent out the manuals to those people who have requested them, and I will complete the certificates and send those out in next week to people who have requested a certificate. So this ends our biomimicry workshop. I appreciate it and hope you all thank nature every day. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mila.